All right. <clears throat> Looks like we're live now. Uh, nobody's watching just yet, but I'll keep it interesting as much as I can for those of you that are watching a little bit after the fact, uh, replaying the stream, uh, because I don't have quite the uh, subscribership to uh, get a lot of people watching these streams when they're actually live yet. I'm hoping that by doing this at this time of day, I might have a better chance of it. Uh, but, you know, right now I got like 126 subscribers, which I thank all of you for that. So I'm not going to dilly-dally too much here. Just going to kind of go over what is up with this Nissan hard body. Uh, I showed it in one of my previous videos, and I've talked about it, I think, once or twice before. And uh, I thought a live stream would be a good way to kind of introduce you to it and what all it needs. So this truck is a 1997 Nissan pickup truck. It's not the prettiest thing in the world, as you can obviously tell. Uh, it has a mismatched fender. It's missing this little corner light. Uh, the bumper's a little bit bent up. Um, let's see here. It's just a base model, regular cab. Uh, regular size box uh, Nissan hard body and uh, it's pretty clean aside from this one spot of rust here as you can see this is a uh, kind of nasty looking but if we can get over that um, I think that it's going to need something in the front end here because if you look at this tire She's pretty prickly, pretty uh, pretty bad on the inside. My guess is, and I haven't looked at it much, actually, I haven't looked at it at all, but my guess is it needs a ball joint or something. <laughs> Maybe an alignment will fix it, but uh, it looks like if we look up, that upper ball joint is not too good, so I'll have to put an upper ball joint there and probably still do an alignment after that. The other issue with it is, and pardon the tools and mess that's inside this truck. Uh, let me get this out of the way. Uh, so if we look here at the old shifter, it um, has a little problem. I'll push the brake because I'm up on ramps right now. So let's see here. This is neutral in it. We go into first. And look, it hits the radio. It won't actually go into first. It hits this uh, dash radio console and all the first, third, fifth gear. Makes it pretty hard to drive. You pretty much can only use second and fourth or yeah, second, fourth, and obviously reverse. Um, so what is causing that issue is there's a cross member underneath the transmission that has been bent up tilted the transmission forward and now the shifter hits here part of the reason why i was able to get this truck so cheap i only paid 300 dollars for this little truck which is an absolute steal because that's right there probably with what the junkyard would pay for it but i'm not a junkyard so i'm lucky to get a car for 300 bucks so we've got that issue, and then the other issue we have is, uh, in part in the wind, I know you're probably hearing some wind noise right now, um, the other issue we have is, and I just took this motor, the air cleaner and stuff off the top of this motor, uh, I have all of it just chilling here, but the other issue we have is when you're trying to drive the truck, it does this like whole bucking type of thing. Um, what I mean is, is if you're like in first gear, second gear, whatever, and you're going down the road and you start giving it any kind of throttle, uh, it will like sputter and buck and kick and surge and everything. And it's pretty much undrivable. I mean, you can get it up going about 50 miles an hour, but it's not a very comfortable ride and it's not running very good, backfiring and everything. So... 
to run through what I have done to address that issue, basically, I, I started off by taking my scan tool and I plugged it in and checked the codes when I first got it. And I've talked about this before, but uh, so the codes that I got were there pretty much everything. I got O2 sensor code. Um, I think there's two O2 sensors. So there's an O2 sensor here. And there's one in the end of the catalytic converter, but the one in the catalytic converter doesn't really do really anything for the way that the truck runs. It's just really more of a catalyst monitor. This one is the one that actually uh, the computer uses to try and go and adjust your fuel and everything. So I got a code for that. And I also uh, was getting a code for the mass airflow sensor and the map sensor um so a lot of cars don't have both right most cars either have a map sensor which is a manifold manifold absolute pressure sensor so what happens is is the computer takes the pressure uh vacuum or so much boost if you have a turbocharged or supercharged vehicle it figures out based on the pressure in the manifold um, what how much air is entering the engine so as you can see this car or truck I should say has this as the map sensor it's actually a uh, they call it a boost sensor on it. it says boost sensor I don't know if it's like a carryover from a Nissan SR20 uh, system or what so it's got that and that that's generally what it's talking about when it gives you a map sensor code. Um, but it also does have a uh, mass airflow sensor. Now, most cars, if you're looking for a mass airflow sensor, you're going to find it somewhere in here. So somewhere in this intake tube between the intake and the uh, throttle body. But this truck is an early style uh, EFI system. It's not throttle body injected like some GM stuff, but it's still kind of rudimentary compared to the other stuff that's out. So the way that this system goes is the mass airflow sensor is bolted up to the side of the throttle body itself and it has a port here. I'm not exactly sure how it figures out what, to, uh, what it should be reading somehow there's like some type of venturi effect where it pulls air through this little hole and puts it down through the motor i'm thinking like this little slot here which normally i would think is a idle air control thing but when you look down in it and i don't think i'll be able to pick it up on my phone here there's actually a hole down here which i think is the actual idle air control and then that's the idle air control valve that just basically uh, bypasses the throttle uh, valve plate thing, butterfly valve, to keep the truck idling correctly. So this actually has like a, a Venturi effect. The vacuum difference between here and here is how it takes your mass airflow reading. So I was getting codes for both the mass airflow sensor and the map sensor. And uh, yeah, so... Those were the things that the computer was saying was wrong with it. And um, when I have multiple codes and they're stored codes, they're not pending codes or anything like that, uh, I look at them, I you know keep track of them, but then I reset the computer. On this truck, as soon as I reset the computer, it popped up a code for the O2 sensor again, and it popped up a code for the map sensor. Um, so, my experience is, is if you unplug an O2 sensor, an upstream, which is what this is, the vehicle just won't be as fuel efficient. It usually won't make it stop running. And this map sensor, uh, I was looking at the live data for it, and even though without the truck running, it was giving me a code for it, which is surprising. When you have it running, I was looking at the live data, it looked like it was working fine. Um, whether or not it was, I'm not sure, but uh, what I did was I just kept it in mind and I started to run through the physical part of the diagnosis. So this was, so I'm talking about just 
the software part, the virtual diagnosis, and now I'm now I started to do the physical part because I don't just rely on a scan tool to tell me what's wrong with the car. It's a good tool, but it's only as good as its operator. So the next thing I did was I tried to pretend like I didn't see what the scan tool was telling me and go through and just do the regular diagnoses. So the first thing I did was I put a timing light because uh, this is a distributor vehicle, as we can see here. I put a timing light on it and uh, I set the timing perfect. So this uh, calls for, I think, a uh, 10 degree advanced. So what they mean is you, is you track the number one cylinder. So here's number one, here's a spark plug for it. So 10 degrees beyond top dead center on number one. So I checked it, it was pretty much right. I set that um, <clears throat> and then I checked that there was spark. I used an inline spark tester, which you can buy at like Harbor Freight. Just plugged it right into here. Verified that there was good spark, at least to number one. And I figure if there's good spark to number one, then, and I don't have a misfire code or anything like that, uh, then I'm probably good. Uh, one cylinder, uh, having a misfire is not gonna make it buck and surge like that. So as long as there's spark in general coming off that distributor cap, uh, I'm happy with it as far as this uh, issue is concerned. So next thing I moved on to was fuel. Uh, this vehicle doesn't have a Schrader valve to hook up a fuel pressure tester. The only way you can do this is inline. So what I did was I came up to the fuel filter and I put my fuel pressure tester between the filter and the regulator. Um, so what I found there was pretty much uh, good readings. Uh, my fuel pressure test kit I have set up to work with a Schrader valve. So when I put the inline stuff together, I forgot to put pipe tape on it. So it was leaking a little bit, but I was still able to pull a good reading out of that. Uh, it was at its worst, you know, 30 pounds. And then um, when you rev it up, it would it would spike up to like as much as 40 pounds because it doesn't run smoothly. I wasn't able to like sustain a rev to see if it would even out to like 35 pounds somewhere in there. Um, it's a little low, but it wasn't spiking like crazy back and forth. Like it wasn't cutting and it wasn't spiking like out of limits. So it's not anything I would expect to cause our issue. Um, so I was happy to say that I had verified that I had proper fuel and I had proper spark. There's still like small things that can cause it, like if I had bad signal to the injectors somehow in the harness or something stupid like that, but that's just a little bit advanced. I just wanted to do like a basic check to start off with before I started getting all crazy with it. So the next thing I did was I wanted to make sure that there wasn't any type of intake leak or a vacuum leak that was causing this. Uh, I didn't expect that there would be, but I just wanted to just double check since it's easy to do. All I did to do that, uh, some people use starting fluid to do this. Um, I didn't have any right handy, but I did have some throttle body cleaner. I think I had some mass airflow sensor cleaner stuff, which I know is safe to spray around a running motor because that's... You know, it's made for those types of parts and dries pretty quickly. Um, and I just wanted to see if the idle chain spraying it anywhere where intake connections are around little uh, vacuum lines or anything like that. So when I was doing that, I caught a little bit into this uh, mass airflow hole. And when I did, the truck actually smoothed out quite a bit. And it was kind of by accident that I figured out that if... When the truck's running, if I unplug this mass airflow sensor and I just keep the engine revved up enough to keep it running, it would not buck like it used to. What it does, though, and the reason why I can't just drive it with the mass airflow sensor unplugged, is it just won't let it rev up because it you know, puts it into some type of... How do I explain it? It's like almost like a limp mode type of thing where... It thinks that the engine is at idle all the time or has no air coming through it all the time. 
it just doesn't have the right uh, reading. So it's almost like you're hitting your rev limiter when you're only at like 2000 RPM. So it's not really drivable that way, but it was steady. It was a steady cut instead of a buck and a surge like it was before and all over the place, it was a steady cut. So, and when you spray the mass airflow sensor cleaner in there with it running and plugged in, it would allow it to rev up higher. Um, so at this point, uh, I was really, really strongly pointing towards this sensor, this mass airflow sensor. Uh, but I didn't just stop there. I kind of looked around and one thing I did find here and let's see here is this here goes back here underneath this bracket and has a vacuum line that goes down to the EGR exhaust gas recirculator. And then it has another line that goes to a hard line that goes on to the back of that, that goes off the bottom. That line was burnt right off. I don't know in what way that might have contributed to the issue, but uh, I have a whole nother one that I found on a truck at the junkyard. There wasn't much parts left on that truck, but this was a lot cleaner. This one, oh, I just dropped it, I'll pick it back up. This one, it uh, had a bunch of corrosion on this, because this piece here is aluminum. It won't rust, but you'll get this weird electrolysis type of deal. And uh, all this white powder filled the lines that go to the top of it. So uh, my guess is that those lines were plugged right up with that powder. Uh, I took them off and sprayed them out, put them back on, but I haven't put that new, uh, I don't even know what that is. It's some type of diaphragm or something. I haven't put that back on yet. Um, I don't think that that was causing the bucking, but I'm sure it didn't help with the way it was running. Uh, I went to try and find this sensor locally and it was kind of tough to find. Uh, but when I did find it, they were ranging between 107 and 130 dollars aftermarket. For, it was 130 locally uh, for a remanufactured OEM one from Napa. It was 107, but the Napa one they didn't have one anywhere nearby. Uh, and it was have, gonna end up happening to come from like Dallas, Texas, and it was gonna take forever. And I like buying local and, you know, from like a brick and mortar store. But when I gotta wait longer to get the part from a brick and mortar store, then they've ceased to, they've ceased to be competitive because they're already not competitive on the price, but then they're not even competitive on the time frame. So. Uh, I'm not willing to pay more in that situation just to buy it from a brick and mortar place. Uh, and I buy enough other stuff. It's not a big deal, you know, when I have to buy it online. So then after I looked into that, I went on to Amazon and found one literally. So remember, the cheapest one I could get locally was 107 bucks, and that was still used and it was remanufactured. I found a brand new aftermarket one on Amazon for the first one I found was like 32 bucks, but it didn't have great reviews. It was like, okay. It was like three stars. I found one with four stars. That was $19. So both of these were much, much cheaper than any local option I could get. And then, um, once I, uh, looked at the Amazon listing for it, I was looking at the reviews because I like to do that whenever I'm buying a car part just to make sure that it's not complete trash. And uh, one of the reviews, which actually wasn't even like a good review, it was kind of a neutral review on it. Uh, the guy said that he put it on his truck, the same truck as I got. Um, and he said, and I'm trying to quote it as best I can here. He said it, it solved the bucking which is the same problem my truck has. So it solved his bucking problem, but it made his truck not run, uh, like made it run too rich, which I can deal with. I'll deal with that truck running rich or blowing a little bit of black smoke, but I'd rather have it run rich than not at all. And so, um, but it was good to know that somebody else had the same problem with the same truck and fixed it this way. So it says to me that there might, that might actually be a common issue with these. So, yeah. <clears throat> um, let's see, I got one person 
watching, which is cool. That's a lot for me. Um, so, yeah. And I don't know what I want to do with this truck. And I'm kind of like looking for any type of suggestion from people that are like to watch my channel. Like I said, it's not a lot. Like, it's not like some type of pristine showpiece or anything like that. But it's uh, something that there's a lot of parts for, a lot of aftermarket parts for. Uh, it's already lowered just a little bit. Um, uh, I could probably lower it more if I really, really wanted to. Maybe put some different wheels on it. Um, and one thing I was considering doing is like a cheap type of uh, build. Maybe like a cheap engine swap. Uh, one engine option that I have in mind is a 4.3 GM motor so like something out of a S10 or a six cylinder full size truck and mating that with the uh, five speed transmission that they come with I think they come with the NV 4500 in the 4.3 truck so that would be a really cool swap for this and then I could do like I already have a power stroke turbo uh, off a six liter truck but the problem with the turbo that i have uh is that it's a dual it's a uh, variable geometry turbo so the six liter trucks they can change the geometry of the turbo with like a valve inside of it and they run off of different veins in the turbo uh, i'd have to look into like if i could even use that on this but i could possibly sell it or trade it for like a 7.3 turbo and use that with a 4.3 engine. Uh, with the connections that I have around, I could pick up the engine and transmission together, uh, running and everything for like less than 300 bucks, which is a steal when you're getting it from a salvage yard like I would be. And I could probably get it for less if I buy like a S10 that's wrecked or something and pull it out myself, which would honestly be the best move for me because at least then I could pull any type of wiring and do it at my pace. But, and then I would just scrap the rest of it and try to work it so that I get the whole uh, deal for free. And then that would be awesome. That'd be an awesome uh, type of deal. Hey, thanks, Nate. Um, so yeah, that's one option I'm thinking about doing. But like I was saying earlier in the stream, it would be best to get this thing to like stage zero. So... I don't want to be talking like getting too serious about motor swapping this until I get it running, which doesn't isn't going to take a lot. Like I said, I'm just going to throw that mass airflow sensor in this thing, and that will that will solve it. And then I can run it around and use it to pick up parts and stuff. Because I mean, I've got my F-150 here, and uh, I'm averaging something like I don't even know like. I might be lucky to get 15 miles to the gallon in this. And then I have this uh, Focus, which I made a couple of videos on if you guys have watched them. And uh, this one is just gonna be one that I'll probably just sell. The Focus, I've done a good amount of little stuff to. So uh, I recharged the AC in it, which I've made a video on. And I replaced this rear wheel bearing, which I also made a video on. And uh, it's a decent little car, but it's not like a big enough savings in gas. Like, because I live in, as you can see, I live in a pretty rural area. So, you know, all the roads I drive are back roads. And uh, when I was driving this, because I drove this for like two or three days, uh, just to, you know, figure it out and everything, make sure everything was good on it. I was able to get like, I think I got like 17 miles to the gallon in it, kind of mixed driving back roads and highway. Uh, and then I had to return the plates to the previous owner. So I'm not driving it now because I don't have plates for it. Um, <clears throat> but it's like just not my favorite car, honestly. Like it's okay for what it is. and. Some high school kid will probably love it. It's got like a little subwoofer in it. It came that way stock. But, uh, excuse me. <laughs> oh, I had to sneeze there. But, uh, you know, it, it'd be a cool little car for some type of high school kid or something. 
and they just need something cheap. I'll probably sell that car for like 1500. I still have to put the uh, quarter glass in it. So if you look here, uh, this is just duct tape, which is super embarrassing. I could probably sell this car for a good profit the way it sits and not even do that glass, but uh, that's just not the way I roll. I want to clean this up first and get it nice and I'll still, you know, sell it for a great deal. I'll probably sell it for like 1500 bucks and somebody will have an awesome little reliable car. Got a fresh AC charge in it. I just put front tires on it because those were, you know, just trash. So they're not brand new, but they're nice used ones. So that's got all that on it. Got a nice uh, stereo system. That wind's picking up again, so I hope it doesn't ruin the sound for you guys. And, uh, yeah, I'll use that money to kind of fund this a little bit. And, I don't know, just kind of go from there. I'm not in into this to be the fastest or coolest thing in the world. Um, what else do I have going on? So, the trailer, which I haven't talked about in a while... Well, the trailer, I've had a couple issues with. So, the old trailer, uh, I was unloading a 4th gen Camaro on off of it. And the Camaro was pretty wide. And I had my brother standing behind me trying to guide me off the uh, trailer. And he was pushing me this way, this way, this way. Because he was only looking at that side of it. And saw that like the tire was hitting the ramps. Uh, not the ramps, but the fenders. And uh, so he was looking at that fender, trying to get me off that fender, but not paying attention to this side. And I rolled that back tire right over this light. And uh, the light broke pretty good. And then I tried to just kind of rig it back together, but that didn't stick. And these Harbor Freight lights are annoying because the wires are just too short on them, as you can see. Um, so I got to take that take that back down probably cut this back a little bit put new connectors on it and then um i hauled a boat recently which i talked about briefly in a video but i don't think i actually made any videos while i was hauling it but it was pretty much like it was a copart deal somebody paid me to haul it for them and one of the lights on that they, they had like a set of lights for it that were just laying there. They weren't even bolted onto it. And I asked them, I said, well, do you care about these lights? Can I take one of them? Cause I had already broken that light. And they said, yeah, we don't care. So I took this one. So I have one that's an LED. It doesn't really match. And it doesn't have bolts in the back of it. So I don't really know how I'm gonna use it. But what I'd like to do is rather than buying a new set of lights, I could just repurpose this one. And again, this is another one where the wires are too damn short. Yeah, but what I'll do, before I install this is I will lengthen these out to like, I don't know, 10 inches or so and wrap them up with some good electrical tape, throw some uh, good old, uh, good old butt connectors and then that'll be good. And uh, yeah, I wanna get this trailer all done. And then um, what I'm going to do is run this for probably the next, until fall in the fall i'm going to have this completely done have a proper winch on it and then i'm just going to sell this uh for whatever whatever i have into it because this trailer makes me money i don't need to make money selling it because this is like my livelihood partially um so i'll get it finished up and sell this for whatever 1500 bucks and then I'm going to pony up and buy a brand new uh, Big Tex. I think it's, uh, geez, I think it's like a 60 CH uh, trailer. So this trailer is only 12 feet. The one I'm looking at from Big Tex is 16 feet, which 12 feet actually, I loaded this truck onto it when I still had my black Dodge. And this truck fits on it, like just barely but the weight distribution isn't right because of where, where the axles are. The axles are too far back, or too far forward, I mean. And so it didn't haul this truck. Like, I literally pulled over and just took the truck off and drove it home. Uh, 
which was sketchy because I didn't have plates for it at the time, but I really didn't have any other choice. I thought I was going to be able to haul it on this because it measured out right, but just where the weight landed on it wasn't good. Um, <clears throat> but yeah, for the purposes of my business, I need to be able to haul big stuff like this. So uh, I'm going to get that 16-foot uh, trailer in the fall uh, to prepare for tax return time. Because that's like when I have to start gearing up for the busy season. Because as soon as uh, Christmas and everything is over, things get really busy for me. So I want to be ahead of the game. I want to have cars ready. So that way, if anybody needs one from me, I have them. And send them right out. Um, like I said, I'm not very happy with how <laughs> the the tips for the fair lead came out they bent right over i thought like that would the fair lead for a winch wouldn't stress that that much that those little strips of metal would be a problem but obviously they did so yeah but i mean that's plenty big enough to put a 5,000 or 9,000 pound winch on so i'll just have to drill new holes i'll cut that fair lead holder off and i'll fabricate up something good for that box so yeah So yeah, um, that's what's going on with that. Oh yeah, and uh, also on the F-150, I was hauling a car and I blew out this tire. This tire goes to the front of my truck. What happened was, uh, geez, I can't remember what day of the week it was. It must have been a Sunday. For some reason, the roads are super busy here on Sunday. So uh, I think it was last Sunday, not yesterday, but a week ago. Yeah, Lee, well, it's nice to see you here, man. All right, so anyway, so sorry about that. Had somebody watching live comment on it. If you're watching this as a playback, you might wonder what I'm talking about. If somebody commented on it live, so. Um, but yeah, so I was I was hauling with the F-150, and I blew out this uh, tire here, and um, after passing an accident. So the people got into an accident, and they uh, left all kinds of debris all over the road. And I mean, I made it up to the accident and uh, found that I didn't really have any way to get around all that stuff. And I picked up something in this tire somewhere and I made it a couple miles down the road before it finally went flat and uh, I had to swap it out. So I really want to patch it, but if you can see, on the camera here around this little edge it's looking a little bit bare like you can see some white spots that's like the fibers of the tire so kind of wore it down a little and uh yeah it's uh not good i don't know if i dare patch it or if i just need to replace it and honestly i'm almost tempted to just take the tire that was a spare tire because even though it's an old tire you can see like the marks from where it was hanging underneath it uh it's perfect like it's brand brand new and it's not really weather cracked too bad at all actually no worse than any other tire on this truck now 